Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but I felt so good this past week and a half or so, maybe two weeks. I felt so proud of who we are as a nation and as a people. This weekend, I felt like celebrating the 4th of July in a bigger way than I have felt in a long time. I have felt so down on us for so long. I felt like when I went abroad, I had to apologize for who we are and what we've done for so long. But this last week and a half or so, I have felt so good. When the Supreme Court handed down its decision about the health care law, I said, thanks be to God that more people will be safe that more people will be granted access to the kind of health care that I take for granted. I say thanks be to God that those who got a taste of that will not now have it taken away. When the Supreme Court handed down its decision about same-sex marriage, I said thanks be to God that now everywhere in this land people can marry the one they love without regard for what sort of body parts they have. I said, thanks be to God that we took one step closer in this realm to the realm of God. When the president talked about and started executing our great pivot toward Asia, I said, thanks be to God that we won't see the Far East as far anymore, that we won't think of those people as people who live on the other side of Europe, but as people who live right next door, because they do. I said, thanks be to God that this world, because of what we're doing in our nation, will be just a little more, just one small step closer to being like the realm of God. I felt so good this last week and a half, and I wanted to brag, I did brag, in my heart. I thought, new occasions teach new duties, right? Time makes ancient good uncouth. And we've let go of so many things that used to be good but weren't good anymore, and we've adopted so many things that have been become good in this moment, and I think it's at God's leading, and so I felt so good. So here's what's going on in today's reading, if you didn't catch it. Paul's writing a letter to the people in Corinth, his church in Corinth. It's actually a part of a series of letters they've written back and forth. Paul had been there and told them certain things about who Jesus was and about how they ought to be, and then he went away. And then these other people came in that Paul called the super apostles. It wasn't in the reading here. He calls them the super apostles, and you should always see sarcastic air quotes in your mind when he talks about the super apostles. Because these are people who have come in and started bragging about all they've seen and known all the visions they've had, all the things God has revealed to them and whispered in their ears. They've been trying to convince the Corinthians to do what they want them to do on the basis of these bragging visions that they've had. And so Paul comes and says, you know, I guess I have to boast. That's the first lines here. It is necessary to be boast. Nothing, it is necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it, he says. But I guess I'll have to. Since these guys are, and I want you to believe me, here's a true thing, he says. And then he says, I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. It's Paul himself he's talking about. He's tell, telling about his own vision. He's bragging about what God has given to him, right? He's saying, oh yeah, those guys, they had visions from God. Well, so did I too, and so you should listen to me. I could go on and on and on, Paul says. I feel so good about what God has revealed to me, and I want you to feel good about it too, so I'll boast 
on behalf of such a one as me. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to this thorn in his side, right? This thorn that was given to him in the flesh. And nobody knows what that thorn was. You ask 10 different biblical scholars, you'll get 11 different interpretations of what that thorn was. We don't know, but whatever it is, Paul does not like it. It hurts. He is not grateful for it, and he wants it gone. He's clear that God didn't give it to him. He says that Satan gave it to him. But then he says this. He says God is turning it into something good, this awful thing that's been given to him that he doesn't want, that hurts, that he is not happy to have. God is turning it to his benefit. God is entering into that broken place, to that hole in his side, to that hole in his armor, to that hole in his boasting. He's bragged and boasted and built himself up. He's built this great, beautiful shell around him, but then this thorn pierces it, and that is the very place, he says, where God enters in. But he wants you to be clear that God didn't give him the thorn. He's clear that Satan gave him the thorn. I don't believe in Satan, but... As we were singing that hymn, that amazing hymn, it used to be called Once to Every Man and Nation, the one we just sang, that oh-so-subtle one. <laughs> as we sang that, or as I was choosing it, I was thinking about that line, by the light of burning martyrs, right? The first part of the second line, and I recoiled as maybe you did at that. And I thought, can we sing this? In 2015, can we sing this line and have it mean anything that matters. Can we sing this in any way except maybe as a historical oddity? And then I realized that only the white pastor of a mostly white church in the North would say that burning martyrs don't exist anymore, would think that that might not be a current reality in 2015. Because there are pastors of black churches all across the South in these United States who know that burning martyrs are real. I sit with my privilege in my office and I say, this does not make sense anymore. And I want to tell you, we have brothers and sisters in a different part of this country and even here who know that it makes a lot of sense. Or if it doesn't make sense, that at least it's real. Paul talks about this thorn that was given to him by Satan, and I don't believe in Satan. But people shot dead at a Bible study, but churches going up one after the other across the South, female black pastors receiving death threats left and right, that's almost enough to make me believe in him. I've been so proud. I felt so good this last week and a half about who we are and the steps we've taken. And yet, there is a thorn in our side, is there not? It would be so easy to boast, to brag, to make ourselves big, to build that shell around us, and it would be red, white, and blue with stars and stripes. We could go on and on about what we've managed in the last week and a half. But there is a hole in that shell, a thorn in the side of our national consciousness, our national history, our national identity of us. And it is the racism that we cannot seem to shake. In fact, that we haven't even really tried to shake. Here's what Paul says, though. Paul says, God doesn't give you the thorn, but God can turn it to good use. 
That the hole it makes, that's the place where God comes in. That the weakness that makes you want to throw up your hands and fall to your knees and weep. In the end, that turns out to be the strength. In the end, that turns out to be the place that God enters in and closes the gap between who you are and who God wants you to be. When you become aware, when you name it, when you see it, when you stop pretending that it's not there and you stop pretending that it's a problem you can solve on your own, that's when you open yourself wide, right in the place where the thorn went in. That's when you open yourself wide and God is quick with grace fast with mercy, ready to enter in and turn that weakness into the very strength that will save you. I felt so good this last week and a half, and yet, and yet. And there's a lot of work we're going to have to do, you and I, Those of us with white skin and those of us with brown skin and those of us with black skin, we're all going to have to do it together. We have a lot of business to be about. But right here, for right now, here's what I want to invite you to do. At that place, right in the place where you can feel the pierce of that thorn, let it open if you can. Invite God in. Beg that God be quick with grace and fast with mercy and powerful in love. We have a lot of business to be about, you and I, a lot of things to tend to, but we will not undo our weakness alone. But God can do it. God can enter in and take that weakness and turn it into the very thing, the very strength that saves us. So here's what I want to ask you to do as you approach this table later in this service. Don't go alone. Remember who else sits at this table? Jesus Christ, to be sure. But not just Jesus Christ those who died at Mother Emmanuel all those weeks ago, and those who lost their churches in the last week, week and a half, two weeks, those who answer the phone and hear terrible things shouted through the receiver. As you approach this table, picture them in line with you. Picture them gathering around the table with you because they will be. And as you eat and as you drink, ask God to enter in, to fill you up, to bridge the gap between who you are and who you ought to be, and in so doing, to bridge the gap between who we are and who we ought to be. Pray hard. Believe deeply if you can that what Paul says is true, that the very weakness that you hate most might turn out to be the thing that saves you. Amen.